Welcome everybody back to the lecture series, Algorithmic Sustainable Design, the Future of Architectural Theory. These are the uh, series of talks broadcast from the University of Texas at San Antonio. And today's uh, lecture will cover fractals and some uh, different applications of fractals. I will first discuss the basis of, of fractals, how to generate a fractal, uh, in particular the Sierpinski gasket, because it's a very uh, elegant little um, example of a fractal, and I'm going to use that to discuss uh, different um, uh, implications of uh, fractals. And then I will go to a physical model, uh, which uh, I call, along with my uh, colleague Kenneth Masden, we call it perforation, bending, and folding which is a physical method of, of obtaining fractals that um, uh, touches home better for, uh, for architects who are used to physical thinking. Uh, then, uh, continuing with application of, of, uh, of fractals, I will um, uh, talk about the anti-gravity anxiety, how fractals, uh, uh, certain type of fractals can give uh, anxiety. Um, and then uh, I will finish with uh, the architecture of the horizontal, which is a continuation of the anti-gravity anxiety. So um, to introduce, um, the topic is a way of uh, uh, resuming what I did last time. Constraints, we want to have constraints to make design easier by narrowing down choices. There are several constraints that guide design to adapt towards innate human sensibility. And those who followed uh, the previous lecture uh, will remember that I emphasized that um, human beings have in their biology, in their genetic structure, in their um, perceptual structure, a uh, certain set of uh, rules by which uh, we uh, negotiate our environment. And um, my, the whole aim of this lecture series is to discuss how uh, architects can best uh, use those rules or can best satisfy the, those rules for human well-being. Uh, what I did uh, in, the, in the first lecture was to show how universal scaling is a necessary but not a sufficient condition for adaptive design. There are so many lectures because there are several distinct conditions for adaptive design, and universal scaling is but one of them. So today I'm going to go on to, to discuss further conditions towards adaptive design, and hopefully um, at the end of these lectures we will have a... Uh, a list of, of conditions that, if satisfied, will give adaptive designs. So let's begin with the Sierpinski gasket. We start with an equilateral triangle, subdivide its sides into one half, and draw three triangles inside the original triangle. We subdivide the smaller triangles into one half and repeat the process. So we have geometric recursion. Let me go forward. Here is the original triangle. And you see that I have subdivided its sides into one half, and I get a three similar triangles facing up. And there is a bottom facing triangle in the middle that, that remains are empty. <coughs> so I'm going back to, to look at the, <coughs> to look at the uh, recursion uh, algorithm. This is an algorithm in keeping with the, uh, with the title of, of the lecture series. Um, I will go now to the smaller triangles and sub subdivide those into one half. So the next step is to subdivide uh, smaller each of the uh, triangle at each corner. I will subdivide into uh, one half again, so I get quarter lengths. And then each of the triangles in, in their corners, namely the, the corner triangle has its own corners, and in each of those corners I subdivide them to get a, a triangle of, uh, of side one eighth. And um, just by going uh, in this way, I, uh, I construct a fractal. Now, a mathematical fractal is going to, is going to go down to uh, uh, infinitesimal subdivision. So um, I'm just showing the first uh, three scales of this interesting uh, fractal. Why do I call it a gasket? Well, this is the reason. When I, when I have uh, finished my uh, drawing, subdivision, then I go in and punch holes and cut out the down-pointing triangles, shown as black. So when I cut these out, I have something that's perforated, a two-dimensional figure. 
made out of, uh, say, uh, a metal sheet that's punched holes in it, and uh, it's perforated, so it's a gasket. Uh, of course, this the sketch that you're seeing is not a is not a picture of the Sierpinski gasket because it only shows three three levels of scale. Um, a good Sierpinski gasket, which you can find in um, in any textbook on fractals will uh, show a nicer uh, graduation, and then you can, uh, to the limit that the eye can observe, you see smaller and smaller triangles as you go into those corners. Now, what's going to um, uh, become um, important later is that the Sierpinski gasket does, is not composed of just tiny triangles all over. There is this structure where the central uh, the central triangle is left empty. So uh, uh, there is a focus on detail so that the subdivisions occur at particular points of, of focusing. Uh, that's, it's, it's, a, it's a topic of, of one of these subsequent lectures, but I just want to point it out that fractalizing does not mean subdividing, subdividing everything. Uh, it leaves, um, uh, uh, fractalizing leaves uh, areas plain and focuses the, 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 the subdivision, the action of subdivision, into a particular regions. And this is going to be important later on. So here is the Sierpinski uh, triangle, which has become a gasket. The Sierpinski gasket is an exact fractal with an infinite number of decreasing scales, if, uh, if done correctly. And the scaling factor is 2. Because if you remember, the, uh, the original triangle, uh, I cut its side into two so that um, each subsequent um, triangle is, uh, is, is one half of the, of the previous one. So I have one over two to the end. So the scaling factor is two. Well, uh, the, the first lecture having to do with architecture proposed the universal scaling with a factor of 2.72. But I'm not proposing the Sierpinski gasket is a model for architecture. What I'm doing here, I'm going to do on a very simple model and then work by analogy and, and argue by analogy to uh, the more complex systems that we encounter in architecture and urbanism. So, so that number is not important, but the fact that the scaling fact that exists, that it is important. Uh, now, I know that triangles and fractal triangles have been proposed as models for architecture. I think that's not a very good application because uh, equilateral triangles are not particularly adapted for uh, human needs and uh, human uses. We must not confuse what looks pretty uh, in a mathematical way to what is adaptive. So here is uh, the uh, um, scaling sequence, which is just the factors of two. Uh, shown on the right, I, I, uh, I pick the downward pointing uh, triangles from the Sierpinski gasket and just draw them on the left. And on the right, I have a sequence of a scale. So this is a scaling sequence by a factor of two. This is um, just to emphasize that I keep going down and down and down by factors of two. So. When we study fractals, we see that there are two different types of fractals, and they work in, in different dimensions. So all fractals depart from uniformity because you are subdividing a structure. So obviously, it's going to depart from uniformity. But then from whatever uniform uh, ground you start from, you can proceed in either of two ways. You can create a perforated fractal by cutting out smaller and smaller pieces. And you have the Sierpinski gasket as one example of a uh, fractal that begins in two dimensions and uh, you cut out smaller, smaller pieces to get the gasket. Or you can get a sponge. Namely, you start with a volume and you cut out little bits of that volume to make it porous and you get the sponge or, or a sieve. A sieve can, can exist in, um, in two dimensions or uh, beginning in two dimensions or curve. Uh, the alternative is to uh, begin with uh, something that's totally plain, uniform, and then start to add smaller and smaller pieces according to uh, uh, fractal construction with um, uh, smaller and smaller uh, self-similar uh, copies of the fractal. So these are called accretive fractals, 
uh, which adds smaller and smaller pieces to build up the fine structure. Um, in nature, we have coral reefs because the corals keep growing and you have the, all these little tentacles that deposit smaller and smaller pieces of calcium to make the coral reef. Uh, the space station, well, it's a rather whimsical example. Uh, you have uh, a large piece and then su successive space missions keep uh, adding little pieces as, as needed and the whole thing will grow by accretion over the years as more and more uh, units are, are, are put on. And cities are fractals. Cities are fractals. This is one of the uh, most important uh, realizations, uh, the fundamental work of, uh, of uh, Professor Batty in London and Professor Frank Oyser in Besançon in France, uh, show that, that cities uh, obey fractal growth patterns. Um, uh, cities uh, all over the world <coughs> in different, uh, different, different um, eras and under different geographical conditions, the growth, uh, growth occurs in the periphery and um, e um, even in the center of, of cities, uh, the transformations of city are very fractal, very much fractal in nature. So here is an extremely large scale fractal that, uh, that compares with other large scale fractals in nature. Uh, for example, I didn't have it here. A river, most rivers are fractals because the river uh, has tributaries flowing into it. It's a, it's a paradigmatic fractal structure your river with all these uh, tributaries. So um, fractals uh, are a model for uh, complex systems that occur in, in nature. I'm going to show how to build a fractal castle by uh, accretion, an accretive fractal. Start with a thick square slab and then uh, I use a, a scaling factor of three and I add four smaller square sl slabs on top in the corners. So rather the reverse process of, of, uh, of doing the Sierpinski gasket. And then each of the um, smaller square slabs will get its own four smaller square slabs and uh, to build the little turrets. And I can, I have here three, uh, three levels and it does look like a castle with turrets and I can continue this to get smaller and smaller fine structure. So this is how we build an accretive uh, fractal. Uh, and already there is some, uh, s some um, resemblance. And the resemblance is not superficial, say, with, uh, with uh, human architecture. Now I'm going to uh, look into why uh, human beings particularly like fractals, the, the information that is presented is, uh, is, um, is, uh, is compressed. And this is what, um, let me explain what, what this means. Uh, the human brain feeds on information and likes to input information. But um, it gets overloaded if, if presented with too much information. For example, when, when we look at a random array or random pixels, uh, either we see nothing because it's too uniform or we're overwhelmed with, with information because we don't see any patterns. What is the meaning of patterns? The meaning of patterns is that they relate different pieces of information so that we don't have to use all our uh, cognitive uh, power to make sense of the information presented to us. Therefore, we, we prefer patterns to randomly presented information. Uh, a random array of letters makes no sense to us, but if, if those letters um, have uh, linguistic patterns, then they, they could make some meaning. And we're much more comfortable with that. Well, what happens with, uh, with uh, fractals? <clears throat> the brain can recognize a fractal and then it is faced by an enormous amount of information, which because of the symmetries and the scaling that occurs, the scaling means that uh, each, uh, each um, detail of the fractal when magnified looks exactly like the next scale <coughs> of the fractal. So 
so you don't have to um, code all these, all the pieces of, of the fractal, of the geometrical fractal, as a random structure. You code it only once, and then uh, you have the, the algorithm that says, we have coded this piece of the fractal. Just repeat the same piece on different magnifications. So that's a very short code. And uh, in fact, uh, this is what's known as fractal information compression, not only used by the human brain, but uh, uh, it's a uh, um, um, commercial uh, program for compression, fractal information compression. It's, it's extremely successful, uh, especially when, uh, when um, used on natural scenery. And why is that? Well, if, if uh, my lectures have any, have any validity, it is because uh, natural uh, structures like uh, trees and, and uh, weathered rocks and rivers are fractal. Therefore, a fractal compression algorithm is ideally suited to compress information in natural scenery. Uh, also, fractal information compression works very well in, in faces, uh, human faces or animal pictures. Now, um, uh, having said that, of course, uh, <coughs> I need to warn you that the pretty fractals I will be dealing with here <coughs> in order to uh, use as examples are not the same as natural fractals. Uh, fractals in nature uh, <coughs> do not have exact properties. There is, there's, a, there's a high degree of similarity on the magnification, but we don't expect things to be a, a pure uh, mathematical fractals. <coughs> Here's the self-similarity shown for the Sierpinski gasket. The original size A, then the bottom right-hand corner B is exactly similar, and the, uh, the right-hand corner of B is C, and that's exactly self-similar, and the bottom right-hand corner of C is D, and that's exactly self-similar. Now, the basis of physiological well-being is, um, is due to many <coughs> different factors, one of which is not to be overloaded by information, and that's where self-similarity comes in. Uh, there is a certain uh, physiological pleasure that um, is triggered in, in a human being when uh, there is coherence in the environment. And the opposite is true. <coughs> a lack of coherence uh, creates some anxiety. <coughs> the human brain evolved to handle self-similar natural structures, and uh, not for any other reason. So we, we react with alarm at structures that exhibit no scaling coherence. Uh, what is scaling coherence? <coughs> Scaling coherence is when uh, an object or an environment has structure on many different scales. It obeys a scaling hierarchy, uh, preferably the, the universal scaling hierarchy. There is a degree, a high degree of self-similarity, so that when uh, details are magnified, uh, there is a similarity to forms on the, on the larger scales. So um, that establishes a coherence. A, a link between different scales establishes a coherence, and uh, we notice that the best architectural environments have this coherence. Of course, uh, the best natural, the most pleasing natural environments have this sort of coherence. I don't mean that a rock is similar to, to a tree, but the tree has the, the scaling coherence because it's, its branches, its branches are, are a perfectly fractal uh, object and, and the leaves, the leaves themselves uh, have have nice arrangements. Uh, the leaves in the tree are not uh, distributed randomly, but the leaves cluster. Uh, the leaf clusters, uh, very reminiscent of galactic clusters, uh, in, in outer space. Um, there is a recurrent structure that's sufficiently similar for us to recognize it and gives us the feeling uh, of of, uh, of coherence, and that uh, results in a physiological well-being. Let me discuss now some fractals in architecture. Uh, those of you who have been to Rome and uh, went to all the beautiful churches like Santa Maria and Cosme Din, uh, if you look, uh, of course, if you look around, you see glorious um, architecture and uh, uh, equally glorious uh, sculptures and uh, uh, paintings and mosaics. But if you look down, you notice the pavements. Well, the Cosmati pavements were built 
were created out of uh, pieces of marble by the family, a uh, special family, Cosmati family, um, whose uh, successive generations worked for two centuries, the 12th to the 14th century, and built some of the most glorious uh, pavements uh, in, in Italian churches, and there is also um, a Cosmati pavement in Westminster Abbey, and uh, I forget if it was done by one of the Cosmati family themselves, or, um, or by a local British um, uh, pavement artist. Uh, anyway, I'm not illustrating that, but if, if, you, if you go to, uh, to, the, to the photos of the Cosmati pavements, you will find the Sierpinski gasket in, a three, uh, in a three levels, uh, beautifully, perfectly formed. So uh, um, um, Professor Sierpinski um, was not the first to discover it, but he was certainly the first to describe it uh, mathematically, the great Polish mathematician. Um, now, uh, let's take an excursion into art history uh, this family worked, uh, successive generations worked for, for uh, over two centuries, and the art historians will rank the Cosmati pavements from the most glorious ones to the uh, sort of uh, okay ones. Uh, and when you uh, look at the, uh, the statements of, uh, of, um, of uh, art historians, you can correlate directly, the, the, what they consider the greatest pavements have more levels of, of uh, self-similarity and scaling than the other ones, which were uh, evidently a cheaper job, so uh, it required, they were paid less, so they, they, they uh, spend less time to make um, successive scales. So here is a nice correlation between uh, um, aesthetic uh, 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 enjoyment and, and emotional nourishment from, a, uh, from an object that was, is, was created. Uh, many African villages have, uh, traditional villages, have naturally fractal plants, but these are not triangular, but circular. And I, I, will, I will discuss that uh, just in a, in a, in a second. Uh, when we look at the Islamic uh, tile patterns, they are intrinsically fractal. They show an, an incredibly high degree of self-similarity. <laughs> and um, the whole series of lectures could be devoted just to Islamic tile patterns. <clears throat> and. Uh, how Islamic architects achieve coherence in, uh, in architecture. It is Christopher Alexander who emphasizes the importance of the tile patterns in Islamic architecture for the architecture. So many misunderstandings uh, occur when um, Art historians say, well, the tiles are just a decoration, and the architecture is the, is the massing and volume of the building itself. Nothing could be further than the truth. What, what I'm um, talking about is that the tiles are an essential part of the architecture because these are the smaller scales. Uh, and if you take what I'm saying uh, seriously, then all scales from one millimeter to 20 meters contribute and either the building is coherent and gives a, uh, an enormous uh, emotional and physiological pleasure to the viewer, or it is not coherent and is either neutral or, or hostile and creates anxiety. So um, <clears throat> it is important to link all, all the scales in a, in, a, um, in a building. Here is the plan of a, <coughs> of a village by Ila in Zambia, documented by Ron Eglash. Uh, Ron Eglash is a mathematician. He has done uh, this uh, uh, phenomenally innovative um, uh, study of, uh, of uh, fractals in traditional and vernacular architecture. So here is a, a plan of the village, and you see it is basically the outside wall is an oval, but it is a fractal oval because each, uh, well, it is not just a, a single wall. The wall itself is made of ovals that have an opening to the left. Each one has an opening to the left, just like the village has the main gate on the left. And uh, each one of the, of the subsidiary uh, ovals has itself a boundary made of ovals that open to the, to the interior. So this is the most uh, wonderful fractal you can possibly imagine from an aerial photograph. Now, uh, you may want to read uh, Ron Inglash's book uh, called African Fractals, where <laughs> he documents many, many uh, different cases of, of fractals. <coughs> Here is another a fractal, no, not from a building, but it shows you the, 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 strong, uh, uh, the strong foundations of the fractal tradition, an Ethiopian silver cross. 
uh, the Ethiopians are, are Christian and they have processional crosses. And here is one where you clearly see the fractal structure and the larger processional crosses, because they are so large, they enable the artisan to, uh, to have smaller and smaller structure. And the artisans have used the fractal tradition in order to create a, a fractal design. Uh, these are wonderful, um, <coughs> uh, wonderful objects. <coughs> Well, uh, unfortunately, uh, we suffer from Western arrogance. So instead of learning from vernacular architecture, which uh, my friends and I do, um, we uh, instead uh, ignore vernacular, ar vernacular architecture and export uh, non-adaptive and absurd design styles and typologies tied to industrialization. So um, th this is a disastrous effect because these industrial typologies uh, erase sustainable local traditions. Uh, we have, uh, we in the West have control of the media and uh, the media coverage in league with globalization and um, commercial forces convinces the rest of the world to abandon their cultural building. So what, what I'm talking about and what Ron Eglash has documented are um, vanishing species, just like vanishing animals, like, like uh, <coughs> the rhinoceros or the, the polar bear, building typologies that are intrinsically fractal <coughs> and which evolved over millennia, not for aesthetic reasons, but to satisfy the human needs of, the, of people living in those climates, a certain lifestyle, with a certain culture. Uh, fractal architecture and urbanism that we see in indigenous architecture around the world develop just like language develop, develop just like the human beings themselves develop. It's an evolution. It's, it's, it's a, um, you, can, you can say without fear of contradiction that uh, vernacular architecture is an extension of biological evolution to just a, a larger dimension. And because of certain ideas that uh, I personally criticize very strongly, uh, they are either, either have they have become extinct in many regions of the world, or they're about to become extinct, and nobody really cares. Um, of course, we uh, have woken up a little too late to the extension of the, of the Siberian tiger or the um, rhinoceros or the polar bear, but uh, nobody is, uh, is, is clamoring for a protection of uh, indigenous um, uh, building and um, urban typologies. Uh, indeed, uh, Uh, those who uh, who uh, who uh, argue for the value of uh, vernacular typologies for today's architecture are a small minority. They include some of my friends, but certainly you will not hear that this uh, this idea discussed in the in the elite architecture schools, who have uh, their own uh, images of what uh, type of architecture is relevant today. Well, I happen to disagree with that, and maybe we can discuss that in a subsequent lecture, <clears throat> but now we have things to do. Um, going back to the past, some more fractals in architecture. The Manueline period of Portuguese architecture, um, 15th century, beginning 16th century, consists of accretive fractals, some of the most glorious architecture in the world. Uh, in Lisbon, the Mosteiro dos Jerónimos, and the uh, window in, uh, <coughs> in, in the uh, convent of Tomar, these are accretive fractals that uh, are highly effective in, uh, in connecting uh, to the user. Um, when you, when you uh, use accretive fractals, uh, you are intelligent about it. So you find them used in regions that are closest to the users. Uh, suppose you are, you are doing uh, stone sculptures like the Mosteira dos Geronimos in, in uh, Lisbon. Uh, well, they take years, years to do. So you want to have those where uh, users uh, can uh, be next to them, see them, and touch them. And uh, you spend uh, less detail on, uh, on uh, the roof line, something that does further away. That, that certainly makes sense. Uh, and that's also a characteristic of, of the mathematical fractals. Um, they're not uniformly covered with tiny uh, little detail. The, the structural information is, uh, is zoomed into a certain region. Now, uh, for, for, for other cultural reasons, you have Hindu temples that are covered with sculptures. 
So the difference here is that this is not a, a, an absolute geometrical uh, fractal. These are human figures, and each human figure does have fractal properties, but uh, the, the, the Hindu temples are, that are, are gloriously covered with uh, human sculptures, each sculpture is in a different position. So you have uh, a symmetry breaking that creates uh, another type of, of emotional uh, nourishment from that, and that's uh, going to be the topic of one of the later lectures. Here is a, an example, probably a Portuguese doorway, where detail is focused in, in a small region uh, the rest of the wall remains plain because there is no need for, for any other uh, detail. Uh, the detail exists exactly where, where you want it, on the door, around the door, approaching the door. Uh, when you are um, entering through the door, the uh, more and more detail uh, as, as you uh, pass through the door. Uh, so this serves the, the best purpose for uh, using uh, uh, focused detail in a small region. A minimalist modernism is not fractal because only the larger scales are defined. Maybe one or two scales are present, but there's an enormous gap between the scales. You don't have the intermediate scales. And without the intermediate scales, there is no uh, scaling uh, coherence to uh, tie together the form through universal scaling or scaling by any factor. Now, if you have, if you have a, a similarity of forms and the factor is too large, then that that does not uh, give you a scaling coherence. If, if you have an object, say, in, in a more contemporary architecture, and you have its, its magnified copy of that is 20 times as large, well, these two sizes are so far apart that cognitively we don't relate them. So there is no scaling coherence. You really need the intermediate scales to tie the form together. The other extreme is postmodernist and deconstructivist buildings. And they're not fractal for the opposite reason. Because usually there are too many things going on in too many different scales. There is a uh, hodgepodge of, of materials um, cannibalized in uh, postmodernist architecture, cannibalized from uh, historical architecture, but put together with, with uh, no relationship to each other, so there's no scaling hierarchy. Deconstructive architecture uh, is even worse because it, it just Wherever it sees something that's symmetrical that could create scaling coherence, it attacks it and kills it, which is its aim, the aim, of course, of the name, deconstruction, which is to deconstruct uh, order structure. Uh, other types of architecture with free-flowing forms, some are successful, some are not. It is tricky to uh, succeed with free-flowing forms because free-flowing forms don't naturally define a system of scales. If you have a, a free curve, how do you measure what the scales are? Well, a curve itself can define many different scales. Say an inflection in the curve gives you a certain size, and then the, the diameter of that curve gives you a certain size. But if, if it's constantly changing, it gives you many different sizes. So they're ambiguous, and there are very many of them. So you cannot uh, define a scaling hierarchy. So these are... Um, uh, architectural styles that are very prevalent today have no scaling coherence, therefore they're not adaptive. Adaptive buildings have to uh, correspond to the hierarchy of scales in the human body, and the human body has scales from two meters going down to one millimeter. And uh, adaptive buildings in all regions and all styles make an attempt to um, to uh, adapt to human uses and senses, and therefore they generate substructure and details in this range of scales, and not only in this range of scales. But I'm focusing here to the human range of scales, because the building will have, will have its own tectonic requirements, the, uh, the program of the building, uh, the materials of the building, uh, they determine the larger subdivisions. But then the architect has, has a, a lot of choice in the human range of scales, two, me two meters down to one millimeter. And that's where a building shows if it's adaptive or not, whether uh, those, uh, those um, uh, uh, scales are included in the building by subdivision articulation how carefully they are adjusted so as to give a, a scaling coherence. Uh, all those are extremely important uh, questions. 
And um, we, that is my, my uh, colleagues and myself, and not mathematical, not my mathematical colleagues, my architectural colleagues, have learned from the great adaptive architecture of the past, the formal architecture of the past, and also the vernacular architecture of the past. So uh, all adaptive buildings will connect through a scaling hierarchy down to the microscopic structure of natural materials. And this is, uh, I, I can go to give another lecture on this, but I really have to, to go on. If you use natural materials, stone and wood, you go down and you have the microscopic structure, crystalline structure of the stone or the cellular structure of the wood. So that, that gives you a grounding at the smallest detail. Well, suppose you use uh, industrial materials. There's absolutely nothing wrong with that. The greatest and most adaptive industrial architects of the uh, end of the 19th century used industrial materials in a wonderfully adaptive manner because they used the uh, mass production in order to put in those details. They're ornamental details. But we have some excellent adaptive buildings from the end of the 19th century. So it's not, it has nothing to do with industrial materials versus natural materials, because that's the first uh, objection you hear from uh, people who don't like um, what my friends and I are doing. They say, well, it's too expensive to use wood and stone. I agree. It's lovely to be able to afford to use wood and stone, but you can use the, the, the cheapest industrial materials, but you don't have to know how to subdivide them, and it's really quite easy. Now, let me move to the uh, second part of, uh, of the lecture, perforation, bending, and folding. I'm going to uh, turn the page and leave the fractals behind, but ask, is there a physical model that can help us to visualize how fractals can be generated? So I will imagine two types of materials, elastic material and plastic material. Elastic is, say, made out of rubber. You can pull it and it stretches. And plastic material, uh, like plasticine, you, you can squeeze it and uh, it it's not going to break. You can squeeze it and it will, it will deform, and if you pull it, it will break. So um, I think this, this model has proven useful to, to visualize certain processes that give rise to fractal structure, and this is how I'm going to do that. Three processes, perforation, which goes along hand in hand with the perforated fractals, but perforation, say, in, in, in architecture, you have perforation of a wall. You get windows, doors, arcades. These are perforations in the wall. Uh, bending in a wall is a departure from straight lines and creates structure on the smaller scales. And folding, folding of architectural elements. If you fold a wall, you get crenellation, pilasters, fluting on columns, etc. And I'm going to discuss uh, all of these. Uh, beginning with a perforation, perforation means semi-permeability. And here, the best example is in biology. Uh, in biology, you need semi-permeable membranes. And those are a boundary that lets something through while keeping other things out. The, the, the whole human uh, body, in fact, any living, any living organism depends upon semi-permeable membranes. It's a secret, one of the secrets of life. Uh, we, uh, human beings, have uh, copied those. For example, in arcades and bollards, they uh, are small enough to let people through. Uh, I mean, they're large enough to let people through, but small enough to keep cars out. And they, they help to, get, uh, to provide an interface between cars and, uh, and the human beings. Um, a, a lovely a semi-permeable um, membrane is a mashrabiya, used uh, as the window grill in traditional Islamic architecture usually made out of wood, perforated uh, a screen. It lets air and light through while keeping people hidden from the outside. Now, and because of the, of the light conditions, if you're inside a house with a mashrabiya, you can go up to it and you can look outside, but somebody on the street cannot see who is looking, uh, who's behind the, the mashrabiya. So uh, something that arose from strictly a, a cultural requirement uh, in the Islamic uh, culture uh, is, a, is a wonderful uh, uh, semi-permeable membrane. Here is a perforation of a wall that gives an arcade. And here are bollards, which are a perforation and keep cars out. Uh, I, I, note, I make a note before, um, before I, uh, I, uh, I move on. The two examples I have, I have uh, shown are a thing of the past. Contemporary urbanists and architects just absolutely refuse to use 
uh, bollards and, uh, and arcades. Uh, so instead, uh, we pay uh, thousands of dollars to go to uh, Italy and Spain uh, in order to experience these uh, great examples of urban uh, architecture. Now, here is the physical model, I promise, the push-pull model, where uh, I have a, a plastic or elastic material I'm going to push or pull uniformly. And the best way to imagine that is to say you have a, a rubber band or a, or a rubber um, sheet and you put sealing wax on it. Now, when you pull both sides of the rubber sheet, the, uh, the whole thing pulls uniformly. So the sealing wax, of course, is neither uh, is plastic nor elastic and it will break and the tension will create perforations. It will create gaps on the smaller scale. And if you keep pulling it, and, and, the, and the sealing wax stays on, on the rubber, it doesn't fall off, then you will break those into smaller and smaller uh, pieces. So eventually you will, you will have only points. So I'm sorry I don't have a, a, a model to show you here, but I will try to, to uh, draw some pictures. And uh, you're going to get colonnades and arcades, or the monumental axis outside the Egyptian temples, which is lined with uh, sphinxes, or with, uh, with, um, with the animal gods. So here we, we are pulling a material uh, uh, in the, um, in the uh, vertical direction and it breaks first into large pieces. You have uh, large pieces and you keep pulling it uniformly. Again, imagine the, the, uh, a line of sealing wax on, on a rubber uh, sheet. Uh, it will eventually break into smaller and smaller pieces as you're separating this out. So applying, let me apply this model to a, uh, to a wall. Pull a wall horizontally, and it first separates into mostly vertical window and door openings. And then if you keep pulling it uh, uniformly, then it will separate the wall into, um, into arcades with large vertical cuts, and then further uh, pulling will separate the wall pieces into columns, and you're creating a straight colonnade. So here I have identified a colonnade with straight pull, and uh, this creates a, um, a, a question about curved colonnades, which, uh, in my opinion, do not work as well as, as curved colonnades for this reason, because the model for curved colonnades um, uh, combines two things that, that are incompatible, but this is not the place to, to, um, to discuss that. Here is a, a sketch of that model. You pull something and it separates first into windows. Note very carefully that the cuts that occur in the plastic material as you pull it, the cuts are mostly vertical. So the windows are higher than they are wider. This is a very important point that will, that will um, uh, come up again and again and again. And uh, further separation uh, creates gaps, uh, vertical gaps, and then uh, breaks the whole thing down into columns and you can have a colonnade. Now, the opposite of uh, pulling is pushing, so I will show what happens when you push. When you push a line along its axis, and it's not, it's not uh, elastic, uh, it will fold uniformly, and it will ge generate meanders. And each meander now is a smaller scale, so you're generating fractals by a physical uh, uh, compression. And if you keep compressing, then maybe the whole thing eventually will create a, a, an over uh, a large scale curve in which uh, uh, you have small scale um, uh, meanders. And examples are the circus at Bath in, in England, where you have um, just a, a line of, of, of houses, which uh, uh, each one is articulated. There, there are alcoves. Um, uh, because of the, of the house shapes, and uh, the whole thing is, is a large uh, semicircle. Uh, circular plazas are surrounded by coffee tables and the alcoves, and temple interiors, which are surrounded by, uh, by alcoves. All these give great experiences. Here is a, is a diagram where you push, you push something so that it bends and creates the meanders, and then um, further pushing uh, bends it uh, into a curve. So the, the push model, uh, now I will imagine what happens uh, when, when you push a, a wall, a two-dimensional uh, wall. Folding occurs along the lines orthogonal to the direction of the compression. So if you're pushing horizontally, you're going to get vertical folds. 
Uh, thus, you create pilasters, thick door and window frames, and ceiling beams. If you're if you're pushing, if you're pushing uh, a flat ceiling, you you create ceiling beams. Or rather, let's turn this this logic around. If you're an architect and you, and you want to create a, a push type of ceiling, you imagine it, and then where you want to uh, have the the, um, the folds of the ceiling, you insert a beam for structural reasons. But it all makes sense fr from this model. Here's a sketch. You take uh, a, uh, a plastic material and you squeeze it and it will bulge out and eventually you will get corrugated. And we see examples of these all over traditional architecture, all over the world. Now, in, in some of the lectures I will, I will uh, later on the urban scale, the boundary of successful urban scale needs the smaller scales that are created by uh, pushing and pulling, and especially folding. Uh, urban scale that is unbounded is, is not usable. It is hostile psychologically. Urban scale that is bounded by perfectly smooth walls is uh, just totally neutral. If you look and study all the most successful urban spaces, you will see that they show the characteristics of, uh, of folding that, um, that I mentioned here. Here is a folded wall that can be uh, a result of, of, the, of the type of compression that I talked about. Um, here is a radial uh, uh, along the circumference. Folding along the circumference will create fluting on a column drum. Why do we have fluting? Well, because... Uh, it is one application of um, of a uh, push of the push uh, along the circumference of an architectural element. Uh, bending will adapt to a volume, so uh, pushing um, a two-dimensional material will create a, a, a if you push uh, and it, it flips up, you create a dome, and the domes are the best for ceilings. They give the most positive sense of psychological enclosure, much better than flat ceilings and even flat ceilings are better than uh, diagonal ceilings, which uh, generate anxiety. Uh, domes happen to be more structurally stable. And the urban space is, is actually is, uh, has the best urban space has the spatial characteristics that, that the enclosed spaces uh, generate. Here is an example of folding on a dome uh, from Islamic architecture. Uh, you can generate this by thinking of, uh, of, of uh, compression, uh, tangential compression along the circumference. So this has created folding on the dome, and it's, it's, it's a beautiful um, and very effective architectural element, which, and it also adds in, uh, to the stability of, uh, of this. Now, uh, let me look in the other direction, still pushing. The push model, vertical push, pushing down, vertical compression creates folding. So the folding for, by pushing something down will create horizontal bulges. Uh, there are no horizontal gaps since those would be generated by vertical tension, and there is no natural mechanism for vertical tension. For this reason, buildings that show horizontal gaps are perceived as unnatural and uh, thus create anxiety. I have drawn some examples of vertical push, which generates morphological features, the thickening, uh, thickening lips and, and bulges that, um, uh, and, and um, uh, uh, domes uh, can be included in, in typologies that occur uh, from this uh, push-pull model, uh, vertical push down. Uh, uh, the, the Einstein Observatory by Erich Mendelssohn. Uh, you can see it, it's 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 pulled and, and molded by by gravity. The the the, the curves, the, the the beautiful fluid curves here uh, are are pulling down uh, as, as the structure is pushed. Um, uh, something else very interesting: classical architecture. Why do we have capitals and bases? Well, if you push a plastiline column, you're going to get a, a widening, a squishing of the top, and you get a capital. And um, the same thing for the base. You, you push that column down from plast made out of plastiline, and you're going to get the base. So uh, um, a, the classical column is a, a, um, an example of, um, 
of the push of pushing vertical pushing now there are certain constraints on the push pull model that are, are created by biophilia and let me remind you biophilia is is our genetic makeup and uh, how our genetic makeup and, and um, biological structure influences how we react to different uh, geometries in our environment our human physiology evolved in gravity so we have uh, extremely fine mechanisms for for dealing with uh, the vertical uh, the inner ear has uh, um, orients us according to the vertical and, and, and the horizontal and we, we deduce where the horizontal is uh, we are a walking animal we know exactly where the horizontal is and we can get terribly disoriented if we uh, are in an environment that has diagonals so diagonals create distress because they seem to defy gravity and the exceptions in architecture are, occur when the symmetry creates an implicit vertical axis I'm not going to talk about the implicit uh, axes now I will do that in another lecture but what I want to say now is that uh, because of the of the uh, of the biophilic attachment to gravity we uh, accept push and pull typologies in architecture that can act horizontally because we don't care we can imagine something pushing or pulling horizontally but we can only handle things that can uh, push vertically along with gravity we cannot handle uh, typologies that uh, have to do with pulling vertically and that creates as the uh, title of, of the this part of the talk that creates uh, anti-gravity anxiety anti-gravity will pull a building upwards or appear to pull the design upwards and then you build a building according to the model the vertical tension on, on a design will first of all break the facade and will cut it where into horizontal gaps and we usually use gaps for either a space left open space or windows so um, it creates a certain definite typology of a typology of horizontal gaps and slits between horizontal slabs this is the anti-gravity pull model the vertical tension then can even pull the entire building off the ground and since we cannot uh, uh, we don't have anti-gravity um, uh, in the physics laboratory we have to still support against gravity so we um, we maintain the building off the ground by using minimal supports which are pilotis to use the French word for a uh, for that invention and here is an example of, of uh, the design that is uh, a typology based on anti-gravity you uh, you take your, your building and you pull it up and then that stretching upwards breaks the building uh, in, in half and um, and you have a horizontal line of windows all along and then further pulling uh, uh, against gravity lifts the whole building up and you have to support it by uh, pilotes now buildings all buildings that arise from this typology the anti-gravity typology are not rooted to the earth well obviously the, their designer wants to detach from the earth but we, uh, regardless of what the designer wants to do, we get a certain uh, physiological feedback, and it's not a positive one. Uh, we feel that uh, this vertical pull is lifting the building up like a spaceship. That does not, uh, that does not uh, uh, make us feel very comfortable. It, the building pulls away from humanity, pulls away from the earth. It's something alien that wants to detach itself from the life of the earth. Uh, and the columns are, should not be con uh, confused with uh, pilotis just because they're both cylindrical so uh, this is an important point L let me show the difference between pilotis and, and columns uh, imagine a, a, um, a uh, rubbery material and you, you have your cylinder and then you pull it you pull it along its axis and if it's elastic it will stretch and it will also narrow in diameter and you, you create the pilotis by stretching upwards okay so this this goes along with the typology it's not a column it stretches upwards because anti-gravity is pulling uh, every element of this building up by by contrast a column is made by compression vertical compression it, it corresponds to gravity you take a plastiline uh, cylinder and you push it and uh, you can squish the the base and the capital they widen and you get the capital and the base and if you keep pushing it um, uh, further you can buckle the column and uh, we know from from uh, from engineering the uh, um, 
if you if you push the uniform in a certain way, the, the buckling is not outwards, but it is it is helical. So you get a serpentine column. And where do we have serpentine columns? Well, in St. Peter's, in the Basilica of St. Peter's, right, uh, you know, right in the middle, we have uh, serpentine columns. I believe they were Byzantine and, and taken to Rome at some point uh, uh, by uh, uh, by the Crusaders. Uh, I'm not sure about that. But. So uh, back to uh, what we're doing. The anti-gravity topology is really an, a perver perverse application of pull. Uh, uh, Nevertheless, it is universally applied to world architecture. There's a consistent application of our pull rule, and the stretching actually breaks buildings and creates horizontal gaps, and many buildings show many different scales. So this is what I've been talking about in a positive way. Many different scales. Isn't that what we want? Some of those buildings, even though they don't have the scales organized, have a certain fractal qualities. But the problem is that the fractal qualities appear in the one direction that creates anxiety. This is the vertical direction. It is a perforated, an attempt at a perforated fractal in the direction that, create, that causes anxiety. So to me, that's not a successful application of fractals. It is a perverse application. So, so many buildings all over the world now uh, follow the anti-gravity topology and generate anxiety. And uh, suppose um, some of those do show subdivision of the smaller scales, but these are not very good fractals, uh, let alone the, 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 the fundamental uh, objection to, uh, to the vertical pool, which creates anxiety. But just in a mathematical structure, it is a one-dimensional fractal because there is no there is no other subdivision. Subdivisions are all horizontal. So this is a mathematically one-dimensional problem uh, with no variation as you go to the horizontal. Here I'm generalizing, but a large number of these uh, horizontal buildings uh, are very uh, uh, poorly conceived uh, if they are fractal. So now I come to the last uh, topic I want to discuss today. I'm going to go over an hour. Uh, I don't think that matters. Architecture of the horizontal. The British philosopher Roger Scruton, who is also an architectural and art critic, described this idea in a 1980 BBC talk, which is reprinted in his book, The Classical Vernacular. So what he said is that um, modernist buildings tend to be horizontal slabs and horizontal windows. And uh, he said there's something fundamentally disturbing about this. Well, uh, I agree entirely. Uh, with, with the vertical pull, anti-gravity model, I, I am able to explain why this is so profoundly disturbing. But now I, I will look into, uh, into uh, other consequences of this, because this method kills design on the vertical dimension, because it simply moves the plan upwards, and all buildings become stacks of horizontal slabs. In fact, Le Corbusier patented the, the domino house. He wanted to make an enormous amount of money by patent, patenting this, uh, the, the design idea. So. Um, uh, in order to help his uh, patent sell, he, uh, he uh, propagandized it uh, in his uh, little pamphlet towards a new architecture, which is uh, full of, uh, of his uh, unproven ideas, which is unfortunately used uh, in all architecture schools today to teach some of, uh, some of these ideas. And, uh, but he was, uh, uh, Le Corbusier was, was a brilliant um, uh, advertiser and propagandist, so he knew how to um, coin a catchy um, advertising phrases, like the plan is the generator. Uh, I don't know if everyone listening knows that Le Corbusier, uh, for a while, made absolutely no money in architecture. Nobody won any of his buildings. So uh, he worked as an advertising. Uh, he published his own, um, his own uh, little pamphlet, L'Esprit Nouveau, and he sold ads. So he was um, just a, uh, an advertising person, one of the pioneers in advertising, not well appreciated because uh, uh, people uh, think of him only as an architect and as an urbanist. So the, the idea of the plan as a generator is that you draw a ground plan and then you translate it upwards to define the building's volume. And this design method is taught in all architectural schools today. What does that create? That creates a vertical pull design that has become the world standard. So the building has no, has no three-dimensional design because 
there is no facade. You're not designing either the facade or the spaces of the interior of the building. All you do is design the, uh, the ground dimension. So um, defining the ground plan and then lifting it in various layers does away with three-dimensional desi three design altogether and, and uh, most of architecture. Um, not having a facade that is, that is designed directly, leaving the facade to be the, the, uh, the indirect consequence of the horizontal uh, lines, uh, does not adapt to the senses. Uh, the, the people, uh, the users outside the building, approaching the building, entering the building. This is, uh, it, ma it makes the design that most people uh, will experience in an urban context, it makes that design incidental. And it reduces architecture to two dimensions. And, and two dimensions in, in another very perverse way, but in a different uh, type of perversion than the, than the uh, anti-gravity idea, because the ground plan, by uh, reducing uh, design to the ground plan, the ground plan is usually not observable in a building because the building is full of different stuff, structure. So no one can really see the ground plan unless this is a warehouse or a big box market where you can actually see the ground plan, but it's totally uninteresting. This, this ground plan. In most buildings, there is a structure in the middle, so you cannot perceive the ground plan. So, so um, it is just one uh, one um, um, uh, tool of design that that takes away adaptivity to human senses, one tool after another. And of course, uh, this design method does not allow the spaces to the building to be designed because spaces are three-dimensional. Uh, the great buildings. In the, even the most modest buildings, you design the spaces and then you put the materials to define those spaces. Whereas here, you, you define a, a method and the, and the spaces are incidental. It's what's, it's what's left over in the design after you implement your system. One contemporary topology that unfortunately <coughs> gives you the uh, uh, anti-gravity model without uh, the imposition of any ideology uh, is the multi-story parking garage. It is incredibly uh, uh, ugly and uh, it's one of the reasons why uh, these uh, structures destroy the urban fabric. Well, I say unfortunately because it's no fault of the parking garage, uh, the functionality of, of having cars supported on, on concrete um, floors with, with, uh, with um, a lot of air to get rid of the fumes, well, that lends itself to horizontal slab topology. So what we must do is we must impose a solution. And that solution is to uh, surround uh, multi-story parking garages with real facades. Now, if you study parking uh, around the world from its inception, from the, uh, from the turn of the, of the uh, uh, 20th century, in the 1920s, people designed very, very uh, pleasing urban parking garages because they had uh, the fronts and the sides to define real facades, uh, not phony facades, but, but uh, uh, um, populated by shops and the ground floor was, was shops. So, so the whole building, even though the interior, most of the interior of the building is a parking garage, you don't actually see this, this uh, deadly uh, horizontal uh, slab uh, uh, typology. And instead you see a, another member of um, of the, of the urban fabric. If we can do it in 1920, we can certainly do it today. Some people may uh, laugh at the next example, but uh, this is Venetian blinds. But uh, my argument is that all the details contribute either towards anxiety or well-being in the built environment. And even a minor thing like Venetian blinds does contribute. Venetian blinds are, give you anti-gravity anxiety because they're horizontal. And furthermore, because of the modernist tradition of, uh, of horizontal windows, we have Venetian blinds in horizontal windows and that just reinforces the horizontality and reinforces the anxiety. 
now, again, you cannot have vertical Venetian blinds because Venetian blinds are meant to block the sun and the functionality, the physics of the sunlight requires that Venetian blinds be horizontal so that you can tilt them and get the sun reflected or um, uh, um, let the sun in as you wish. But we have uh, Venetian blinds are just a technological application of the older louvers. And we knew how to build louvers because louvers uh, built of, of uh, wooden slats were surrounded by a nice vertical frame. So this is the, the simplest solution that actually, going back to, to traditional architecture, the problem has been solved. Instead of having a, an anxiety-inducing uh, horizontal window with, with Venetian blinds, you have a vertical window with, with a, a vertical frame that undoes uh, any possible um, uh, anxiety created by the horizontal Venetian blinds. Uh, last example I want to discuss of, of a horizontal typology is the garage in suburbia. Uh, ever since uh, Le Corbusier's houses, uh, we have put the garage opening as the principal uh, feature of our uh, housing facades because we want to drive up to it uh, and have the, the, the garage open. Well, because of the shape of the car, the garage opening is a, is a huge horizontal gap that, that is much more prominent than a front door, which is hardly ever used, or the windows uh, in our house. So uh, driving around suburbia, you're faced all with these, uh, you're faced with uh, hundreds and hundreds of horizontal garage openings. And, and these contribute to the deadening fe uh, feeling of being in suburbia. There's no attempt ever made to frame the garage opening or to provide a canopy or a roof which would improve the design. And how do you want to improve the design? Well, according to, um, to the model I have outlined, it, it will, should be very easy to improve the design by making the garage opening appear to be a typology of a vertical push, or at least not have it as a horizontal hole in the side of the building. Uh, I'm not going to, uh, to, to give uh, such solutions, but um, if, if, you look, uh, if you look again in traditional architecture, where uh, uh, the first automobiles uh, were uh, housed, uh, or, or uh, uh, the, the, um, the typologies used for, for coaches, uh, you have so many um, solutions that, that, that uh, can, um, can undo this uh, this uh, deadening feeling that we have in suburbia. Well, that's for another lecture. Uh, finally, uh, what what uh, is is the uh, message of this uh, of this particular uh, talk, the second talk in the series? Many building and urban typologies that induce anxiety in the viewer were introduced in the early 20th century. These typologies have become standardized. Then standardized typologies are copied without ever thinking about the consequences. Our built environment has become deadening and we don't realize why that is so. Well, why is that so? The turn of the, the early 20th century saw a, a, a tremendous uh, um, searching for new building typologies, new uh, uh, new application of materials. We had uh, uh, new, stronger materials for the first time in the history of, uh, of human civilization, and we wanted to apply them, and we also searched for new typologies uh, w where we, we could apply them. And um, uh, what I'm suggesting is that some of these applications were misapplications because they're anxiety-producing. Uh, we can create all the, all the technologically strong materials we want, but we cannot change uh, human nature. That's the point of, uh, of biophilia. Human nature cannot be changed. Uh, we can pretend that um, human beings are no longer uh, ruled by our biology and uh, we are just uh, uh, robots, uh, robot consumers of consumer products. But that doesn't work because um, uh, our bodies react physiologically to the built environment. And uh, if, you, uh, if you surround us with anxiety producing uh, uh, buildings, uh, uh, then we feel anxiety, and uh, we have a, a psychotic society that uh, spends most of its time uh, feeling anxious. And um, but maybe maybe that uh, that ties in with uh, 
driving uh, the um, anxiety feeling society uh, further and further into the consumerist mode and uh, fueling um, uh, uh, contemporary economy. Well, those are questions that, that don't belong to this lecture, and uh, um, I hope to see you next time. Thank you.